following virtue ethics. <laughs> <laughs> so all I know is they're named after Renaissance painters. Yeah, it's art history as well. Or art, <laughs> art angels. Yes. Right, yeah. right. Um, so yeah, well, we're going to be off on July. And then uh, in August, we will come back and we'll probably do existentialism. And then after that, we'll just give me your suggestions. I'll begin. Okay. So existentialism will be good if you're interested in postmodernism or if you're interested in critical theory. It all goes back to existentialism one way or another, I think. Um, anyways, okay, good. Um, with that in mind, uh, Roni's going to do the book talk and then he's going to take, uh, take the rest of our time. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dave, for, for inviting me to do this. Can you guys hear when I talk? Okay, so um, a couple of books. Uh, I actually got a lot of the notes for tonight from these books, plus from some other sources, but I do highly recommend them. The first one is Abortion in the Early Church by Michael Gorman. This was, um, do you want to maybe put it up there? You can look at it, but then put it up. Where's the... I'll do that first. Okay. Yeah. This book was published in 1982. And Michael Gorman, I want, I want to say, is some kind of general Protestant. I want to say either Methodist or Presbyterian. Okay. Um, there's, there are theoretically differences between the two, but in the mainline churches, I'm not sure that they still exist. Um, but anyways, he um, went through and really looked at um, what pagans, um, what, what was going on in the pagan world around the church, how um, the Jews looked at abortion, and then how the church addressed it. And the vast majority of the book really deals with the first 500 or so years of the church. And it's really fascinating. And it's a very, it's a page turner. It's a pretty quick read. So, so that is outstanding. And the, comp, and the complimentary volume is from 2008, Dennis DeMauro. De, uh, pastor DeMauro, Dr. DeMauro is a pastor in the North American Lutheran Church, the NASC. NASC. And he chairs the Lutherans for Life team. Um, at his congregation, he was also on the board. This was published in 2008, and he touches on the early church, but then actually just walks the, his, the church, um, the, the witness, the history of the witness of the church on abortion to, to 2008, to the present day. So he kind of picks up where Gorman leaves off. Um, on the early church, he doesn't spend, he doesn't spill as much ink, but he brings in a number of the church fathers that Gorman did not have. And I think the difference is, is just accessibility. You know, in 1982, you were still going to the library and pulling books off the shelf. And in 2008, DeMauro was referencing a CD-ROM which had everything digitized on it. So I think, mm -hmm. I think the difference, I don't think that DeMauro is better than Gorman. I think it's just an issue of what was accessible to him. So both of these I bought on Amazon. They were about 20 bucks each, maybe give or take a dollar or two. So if you want to put, can you put this on the on the screen. So I recommend both of them are pretty much page turners. Okay. And, and I do highly recommend them. Uh, and we're not going to have time to go into all the depth that's in these books, but I highly commend them to you uh, for more reading. Michael Gorman is a New Testament scholar. He's a Raymond E. Brown Professor mm -hmm. of Biblical Studies and Theology at St. Mary's Seminary and University. Yeah. Interesting enough, Bruce Metzger was his, was his oh, yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. And I don't know who Bruce Metzger is. Doing, I have, oh, he's a new yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's outstanding. He's so outstanding. this Trinity Seminary, it's a, it's actually, it's kind of, it's a cross between Catholic and Protestant. It's, it's kind of an interdenomination. Yeah, he's place. United Methodist. He's United Methodist. Okay. So, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And Dr. DeMauro and I are Very Facebook nice. friends. <laughs> Dr. DeMauro and I are Facebook oh, friends. Nice. So he's a really nice guy. And then Gorman, when I put that book on Facebook, Dr. Stiegemeyer from Irvine gave it a thumbs oh, up. Did he? Okay. So, so we have, we have some good, um, some good, rec some good thumbs ups on that. Okay. So basically um, what I'm going to, I sent you guys, if you want to look at the books, you may. I sent you all um, the hand, or Dave sent you all the handout. I'm not going to go over every line of it, but what we're going to do is we're going to go over um, pagan practices in antiquity. We're going to go over um, pre-Christian Judaism, and then we're going to go over scripture. And I sent you a whole lot of scriptures in a separate mailing. We're not going to go over all of those scriptures in depth. I've selected three of them that we'll look at briefly. And then we'll go over what the response of the early church was to what was going on um, around them. So starting with antiquity, um, 
abortion, child sacrifice, infanticide, child exposure, where they were basically left out um, to die if they were unwanted. Very common practice throughout um, the pagan world. Um, in the Levant and the Mediterranean, kind of before the Greco-Roman um, era, um, you had child sacrifice uh, to a number of gods. You have the god called Molech, which we should all be familiar with through scripture, or in the Septuagint, it's called Moloch, and it's just different pointing of the words name, Lam, and Kaf. Um, and um, that was an Ammonite and Phoenician deity. Um, you saw sacrifices in the Mediterranean and Canaan, that whole area. And the reason that people sacrificed children to Molech, it was a, it was a prosperity thing. They did it for prosperity. The Moloch is the god of uh, fertility and the god of prosperity, and they did it for personal gain, you know, for personal prosperity is what they believed. Um, there was also a goddess named Tanit, um, virginal mother, mother goddess and fertility and her consort Baal um, and children were sacrificed to those two gods as well. Um, there have been ruins um, testifying to this all throughout the Mediterranean area. Probably the one with the largest number of ruins is at Carthage. That was a major center for child sacrifice and infanticide. And Pastor, you sent us an article from, I think, Biblical Archaeology Review when we were doing yes. the Minor Prophets. Yes. And, um, but, but the town of uh, Ashkelon, which has been on the news lately because it's getting pummeled with rockets from Gaza, that's a town that back in the day was a Phoenician town. Lots of evidence of child sacrifice that took place there as well. So this was a huge thing. Significantly, God's people, the Israelites, were engaged in syncretistic religious practice with the gods of the area, including child sacrifice. They were supposed to rid the land of these foreigners and their gods, and they didn't. And you see evidence throughout scripture of syncretism, where they would sacrifice their children to Moloch and then walk into the temple and participate in the worship there. Where I gave you some scriptures here. The list is not exhaustive, um, but you can look it up on your own. Um, but, but God's people did engage in that. It was not the teaching, but it was a, a syncretistic practice in which they engaged. So, um, so that's kind of the... Uh, well, they inherited it because they didn't, they married the foreign women yeah, yeah. and brought their gods in with them. Solomon was huge on that. Well, you have a thousand wives and 700 porcupines or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was David with 300 wives and 700 porcupines. But anyway, yeah. And I gave you a reference in Acts where Stephen actually referred to that in his, in his uh, sermon before he was put to death. So now in the Greco-Roman world, and there's going to be a lot of overlap with what I'm telling you today and what we talked about with euthanasia um, next time. The Greco-Roman world had a utilitarian view of human value. These are the pagans there. Based on the ability of the person to contribute to the vigor and strength of the state. So you're going to see a lot of overlap here. If you could not do that, your life was not worth anything, basically. So um, they, they practiced abortion and they practiced infanticide. Um, they used, a, they had chemical and medicinal abortifacients, just like we have today. I've listed a number of them for you on the chart. There were mechanical and surgical techniques for abortion, just like we have today. Wound binding. Um, they use surgical tools that are really, when you look at them on the computer, they're not very different from what GYN people use today. And sadly, I've seen one of those take place in abortion many years ago, and the tools look very similar. So really, things haven't changed a whole lot. And abortions were done from day 10 through the seventh month of pregnancy because term mothers died if they had abortions. So they were basically fatal to the mom. Motives are the same as today. They did it to conceal illicit sexual activity, preserve sex appeal, population control. A big uh, motive was financial, uh, we did just as we hear today. Feed the many Conservation mouths. of wealth, can't feed that many mouths, can't afford. So people, women did it in spite, you know, if they had, if a man made her pregnant and then left her, she'd have the abortion to spite him. Failed contraception, they had different techniques for contraception. If that failed and they got pregnant, they would have an abortion. And occasionally to save the life of the mother. So that, so abortion was very widespread in the Greco-Roman world. Infant exposure was also widespread. They considered child sacrifice to be barbaric. 
So they didn't, so they basically just left the babies out to die. And wild animals would come and pick at them. They would certainly starve. They wouldn't have any food or water and they would just be left there to die. Very common thing. Were you, did you see the letter that, I did. Okay. There was a letter. Um, there was a letter. I didn't bring it today, but pastor showed me a book. It's really a very interesting book on how Koine Greek was used mm. in everyday conversation. Um, it was a letter from a s s officer to his wife Yeah. in the Greek, and then they translated it in English, but basically said, if it's a boy, name it so-and-so, if it's a girl, expose it. Yeah. So very common. Mm. If they didn't want a baby, they basically exposed it. Plato um, talked about life beginning at conception, but if a woman who is above the age of 40 conceived, get rid of it, okay? Either abort her, abort it, abort the baby or expose the baby. Aristotle was big into eugenics. Mm. You know, we think Aristotle was this wonderful man, right. that Aristotelian this, Aristotelian that, but he was big into eugenics. If, uh, if, uh, if the baby was not right, if they were spaced too closely, get rid of it. He said, Basically, he said early abortion, and he said before 40 days for males and 90 days for females. What I don't know is how he knew if the woman was carrying a girl or a boy or a, a, a young, little girl or a little boy. That part, I just have no clue. But that's that's was a plus or a minus. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, so kind of stick. And the Romans had a law, which Pastor alluded to, a father may expose any female in for any deformed baby. Abortion was discouraged, but no penalty. So um, sex selective killing of babies that you see in China, you know, killing girls, that's been forever. Women have always gotten the short end of the stick when it comes to abortion. People today talk about women's rights, but the girls were the ones that were killed in preference over, over the boys when it comes to exposure. Now, there was, there was opposition, okay? Not every pagan was, was onto the abortion thing. There was plenty of opposition. You've got the oath of Hippocrates. Nobody really knows who wrote the oath of, of Hippocrates. It probably developed over three centuries or so. Um, but it basically says, neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. Similarly, I will not give to a woman um, a pessary to cause abortion. A pessary is something you stick up the vagina. So, um, so, so it's clearly in the Hippocratic Oath, and the Hippocratic Oath has probably been used more by post-Roman physicians than, than at the time, but it definitely, or Greek and Roman physicians, but it was there. But there's also evidence that Hippocrates himself did do abortions and also uh, did a little bit of euthanasia. So it's not like he was a saint. Mm -hmm. um, well, he, he wasn't a believer, so he wasn't a saint, but you know what I mean. He, he was not perfect in that, in, that, um, in that area either. And um, the Orphics were um, opposed to abortion because he thought those who, the, the souls of the babies who were aborted were um, doomed to an evil fate. Then you had people like the Stoics and uh, Cicero and Augustus who thought that abortion was bad for the state. So they were opposed to abortion, not because they thought the baby had any rights, but because they thought it was bad for the father and bad for the state. So really, so they were, they were on the right side, but for the wrong reasons. And um, in the early third century, there were some Roman anti-abortion laws, but again, these focused only on the father and the woman's duties and on abortion as a bad example nothing to do with the rights of the baby or the sanctity of life for the baby. So that's the Greco-Roman. So it seems like most of the Greco-Roman uh, practice was determined by utilitarianism. Absolutely. Either way, either pro or con, right. utilitarianism. So now moving on to Judaism. Um, Judaism, what we know about Judaism is derived from the Old Testament and then the Mishnah and Talmud. Um, and the Mishnah and Talmud, they say, is stuff that was scripture, but was passed on not by writing, but oral by word of mouth, it's oral tradition. So there were multiple schools of Jewish thought, but overall, in fact, the Gorman talks about um, an Alexandrian school and then a Palestinian school that was divided into a majority and a minority opinion. Doesn't get into Babylonian or any of that stuff. He didn't really address that. So all I left it as multiple schools. Overall, the big picture was abortion in the Jewish world and exposure of infants was totally unacceptable. Three big reasons that show up in these writings, they felt the duty to populate the earth, which of course is from scripture. 
and also to ensure Jewish survival and divine presence. Somehow they have this concept that Yahweh's presence, if none of them were there, Yahweh was not present on earth. Um, at least that's why Gorman interprets the writings. But I've never read that. Yeah. It sounds like interpolating the gods of the land theology into yeah. the Jewish theology. They also have this idea that when somebody dies, unless you perpetuate their memory, they cease to exist, right? Well, that's yeah. that's right. modern Judaism. Okay. And it's all and it's not. There's three oh. major strains, and I think one of them holds to that. The other two don't. Okay. Yeah. This is Judaism before um, the advent of uh, before Jesus incarnation. Okay. I shouldn't say so this is real Judaism, not not the, the fair stuff. Saint. That well, it's, what we have is fair say Judaism. Yeah. Because that's the only ones that were left after the yeah. Bar Kokhba revolt. All the Sadducees were killed, so all you had left was the Pharisees. So modern Judaism, even the Hasidic Jews, come from the Pharisees. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. They also believed this is in the sanctity of life as God's creation, which makes sense. They also had horror at the sight of blood and bloodshed. Well, because the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood, yeah. So that's okay. in scripture. Yeah. So, yeah. So there was a majority view. This kind of came out of the Talmud, and there was a majority view. Now, when I talk about majority and minority, I'm just going to answer a. I'm going to anticipate a question up front. I don't know if majority is 50.5 percent versus 49.5 percent, or if it's like 80 20 or 90 10. I tried to Google it, and I could not get a straight answer. And it maybe maybe vary based on the particular position. So. So, but majority view was until the birth, the baby was legally considered to be appendage to the mother um, in Judaism, according to the majority of view. If the life of the mother was threatened, abortion was permissible and mandatory even. They said, kill, uh, take the baby out to save the life of the mother. The minority view is interesting, that the baby in the womb is legally a person in his or her own right while in the womb. And in Genesis 9, 6, they just put the comma in a different place. The, the, the scripture there says, whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. That's how it reads in the English Standard Version. And the, the two Hebrew words were ha'adam, be'adam. And they move the comma from between ha'adam, be'adam to after be'adam. The prefix be can mean either by or in. So the, minor, the majority of you read, would read that verse, um, whoever kills the man, by the man will he be, will his blood be shed. The minority view read, whoever kills a man within a man, his blood will be shed. So this is a minority view that took that passage in Genesis. This is in the aftermath of Noah. Mm -hmm. And um, and and the world is going to be repopulated. And um, and this is um, and they read this as the as the baby in the womb being a separate person from the mother. So I thought that was very interesting. But Jews never, um, never um, did elective abortions, which, and, and even pagan historians noted that. They said, man, we're doing all these abortions and exposures, and the Jews never do that. So they made notice of this in their histories. Would you guys open Exodus 21, um, 21, 22 through 25? If you have the Septuagint available, that would be good too. <laughs> <Get it. laughs> Pastor can read it in Hebrew. The Septuagint would be in Greek, actually. Oh. Let me get my Exodus on. Um, 21 and say 22 through 25. Okay, and as soon as Pastor comes back, as he would say, I'll ask somebody to read it out loud and in English. This is really an interesting text, and especially when the, the, the Greek comes out. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So, Kirk, would you read that passage in English? The okay. Exodus 22 through 25. When men strive. Exodus 21. Okay. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judges de determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. Thank you. So this text, um, so interestingly, the Jews um, use the word harm here to apply to the mother, um, not so much the baby. Now, that's not necessarily how we read it, but they read it as harm. We'll get to the Septuagint in a second. Say, but they, they applied the word harm <laughs> to the mother, okay? And the thing to notice that's extraordinary about this, this is an accidental harm, okay? This is that you get two men fighting each other and they hit a pregnant woman. So this is totally accidental. And what's happening is if you kill, let's say you have two men, or let's say you kill a man accidentally in scripture and it's totally accidental. You have the cities of refuge that you can right. run to. Mm -hmm. Here, you don't have that. You have, basically, if, you, if you're harming, even if you're arguing it's the mother, if you're harming the mother, there's the lex talionis, meaning eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. So if you kill that mother, you die. You cannot run to the city of refuge. Now, Pastor, can you tell us what the Septuagint says on that? Well, and if two men are going to blows, and the um, the woman should uh, have the carrying in gastry and having a, a child in the womb, and it may come out the child of her not having a um, out of the economy, out of the economos, um, it, I guess imperfectly formed. Yeah, not fully formed. Okay. Uh, then, um, then, then, so it's about the child. Yes. Okay. Um, he shall pay with the val with with whatever valuation, and then it goes through the valuation. But if it's perfect, but if it's formed rightly, if it comes out. Um, of the woman, and then then um, he will give according to what is worthy. Yeah. So basically, so there's a different so the, so the Septuagint um, dot interprets this as being the child, and the difference between no less harm and harm is what, at what stage of development the child is. There's a, it's it's illegal either way. You pay a fine either way. But if the child is fully developed, there's a more serious penalty. So this is an accidental abortion we're talking about. Or miscarried. Or, or if the, the woman miscarries, you know, because you struck her. You're liable in a way that you're much more liable than if you accidentally kill a man. It's interesting. Suke ante sukes. Soul for soul. Yep. So you could potentially, if that baby is fully formed and comes out dead, you could be, you could be put to capital that. punishment. Right? Capital punishment for mm -hmm. that. So again, you don't have the cities of refuge. So the, the, the value of life is so high that you're basically, if you accidentally kill a pregnant mom and her baby, or if you accidentally kill the baby, the penalty is much more severe than if you accidentally kill another man. I thought that was very interesting. Um, I wonder if that motivated the society to be extra careful around a pregnant woman. Maybe so. Yes, and it also made so. the horrors of war even more horrific because when they would, when they would kill, when they would go into a conquered area, they'd take the babies and dash them against stones and uh, rip the babies out of the mothers. I mean, the Nazis didn't start this stuff. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it has to do with the life potential there. Anyhow, yeah. So the Jews are the probably, they don't have a lot of grace for this. No. So in our day, if a woman has an abortion, um, she uh, grasps what she's done. God's forgiveness is for her. It can be declared to her. She can be totally forgiven. 
um, but they didn't really have a concept of that. You, you had the sacrifice, but you never knew if that was enough. You know, you sacrificed and hoped that on the coming sacrifice, yeah. but we have the surety that Christ's death covered over all sin. Yeah. So the Jews are actually very close in practice to where we are. And if you hear even modern people like Ben Shapiro, he gave a talk at the March for Life a few years ago. Mm. It was, I mean, in the public square, there that rabbi that testified on the same panel as pastor as President Harrison before Congress a number mm. of years ago and the mm. more of patience. I mean, they're very close in practice to us. Just their underlying understanding is extremely flaky. So if I was in Congress testifying and Ben Shapiro was sitting next to me, I'd be happy to have him. But I would not invite an Orthodox Jew into the church to talk about life issues to a church convocation. Unless, unless it was, unless he was willing to, or she was willing to hear the other side. Yeah, <laughs> I would. Okay, well, let's just say that I would not let that be the last word. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I would not let that be the last word. So that's kind of all the non-Christian stuff. I gave you. I'm not going to go through all of these scripture verses that that I sent out, and all of these are not exhaustive. I'm starting to use that as a uh, as a um, uh, and a. Just kind of just be aware because I gave one of those um, hymn studies once and somebody came up to, why didn't you pick this person? No, no. So I, I'm just saying up front, this is, not, this is not exhaustive. More than you do about something. That's right. This is not exhaustive. So anyways, the first thing I wanted to talk about was just the very language of scripture. And um, I put this on the board. I don't know if you guys can see the board even at home. Um, you probably cannot see what's written. Can you read it from home? The board? First row for sure, yep. You want to bring it around? Bring it down here. It'll bring it a little bit farther. I don't know if that helps. Steve said he could see it. Can you see it now, Steve? Probably easier before. Top one's Raham, Brafos, yeah. and Pharma. It was yeah. easier before for me. Okay. It was easier before. Let me move it down. Okay. So a couple of words, the pharma post we'll get to in a minute. He's going to have people. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so just, just if you look at the Old Testament, again, these are not exhaustive examples, but this three letter, this root, the, it, this is the same root for the word womb and for the word compassion. So the mm. word womb and the word compassion come from the same root. It's, and, and the difference is how you point it, Raham mm. or Rachem. Rachem would be womb and Raham mm. would be compassion. And it's the exact same word, basically. So, um, so whenever you think about a woman's womb, you're talking about compassion, you know, on the baby inside, okay? Um, and then on the Greek side, again, these are just examples, but scripture is loaded with this stuff. This is what I love about looking at the languages is that there's so much theology that gets lost in the English. There's so much information that gets lost in the language of footnotes. The word brephos is used to, it's the word used like the word fetus has traditionally been used in Latin. It's a word that refers to babies in the womb and babies who are newly born. Infants. Infants. So there is no distinction in the wording between whether the that person is in the womb or has emerged from the womb. Is that true of modern Greek? I don't know. Do you know modern Greek? I don't know modern Greek. I can read it, Okay, I don't know what their, their constructs are. My guess is the pro-deaf people in Athens have invented a different word, but I don't know about that. <laughs> and actually, what I found is, even though this is not the case in scripture, the word technon is used in the didache to child to an infant. And, and, and child about two, two, three. Yeah. So anyway, so that's just a little bit of linguistic stuff that I have found in scripture. Well, pharmakeia. We'll get to that in a oh, slide. I was going to say. Yeah, I'm going to get to that actually in, a, in about two minutes. Maybe knows a pharmacist, I'll tell you what they really are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I did think about that. Yeah. Okay. So I gave you scriptures under a number of different headings. I'm not going to go through them right now. But the overview, the point that, and I gave you a few catechism readings too. But under the overview, the point is God created man. This is what scripture said. God created man created man to procreate, and that's a much better word than reproduce. Uh, procreate is God's work, reproduction is a factory and, you know, and genetic modification and all this kind of stuff. So God commanded man to pro procreate. He wants to restore his image to fallen humanity. So even though the image is lost, he wants the image restored. 
doesn't want to restore the image to my cat or my cat that died. He wants to restore the image to humanity. But if the kitty is necessary for your eternal happiness, you'll see it. In the yes. <laughs> Otherwise, you won't miss it. Yes. <laughs> God commands man not to kill, but sacrificially love his neighbor. And the Hebrew word that I read, both in Exodus and Deuteronomy, refers, in addition to, I'm going to kill you, premeditated murder, refers also to accidental killing. That's mm -hmm. uh, different than, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's the overview. Overview, God wants life, not death. Under weakness, um, and this is relevant for life issues, Jesus became weak to defeat death and effect salvation. He did so for all regardless of personal attributes. So he died for the little baby with trisomy 21 Down syndrome. He died for babies with bad cerebral palsy. Um, the weak are indispensable members of the body of Christ. And this is written in, um, second, in first or second Corinthians, one of those passages that I listed. In the womb, scripture testifies that both in the Old and in the New Testament, that God forms each individual in his or her mother's womb as a unique person for whom he has a plan. Throughout his time in the womb, Jesus was fully God and fully man in the womb and sanctified the womb with his presence. Babies in the womb may hear God's word and have faith. And that you look, just look at Luke 1. When John the Bat when John the Lutheran um, kicked around in the womb in the presence of Jesus, Jesus was a tiny first trimester baby, what Planned Parenthood would call a blob of tissue. Okay, you look at John as being unborn. Jesus was he tiny. Was six months old. John was six months. Yeah. So anyway, so babies in the womb may hear God's word and have faith. And in our church, you see that pastor. We'll, we'll go on the womb of a one. I've announced more pregnancies here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because the mothers are coming. Okay. And so I got to pass on this fair blessing. Well, preserve me and bring to Beth the grace of the Lord. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and that baby is here in the pastor. Okay. Now we're going to talk about. You know why, really why I do that? Because of miscarriages. Yeah. So that I can give a woman whose baby has died in the womb. Comfort and consolation in knowing that that word was spoken over that child at this altar. Can you guys hear, Pastor? It's the word saves, right? Faith, faith comes by hearing that by the word of God. So but that that's one of the reasons. Is, yeah, I have fun announcing first, but that's what I'm yeah. totally. Excellent. <laughs> Now, this is where pharmacia comes. Um, I gave you, um, abortion is mentioned in scripture. Okay, some people say, nobody ever mentions abortion in scripture. Well, it is. The Old Testament text we looked at, that was the Exodus 21. It's, it's implied throughout scripture, but have a look. I picked, uh, pick, take a look at Revelation 22.15. You don't have to look at all four of the texts that I have there. Um, That's at the end. Mentions dogs. Yeah. So would you like to read it, Kristen? Sure. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Thanks. So that, um, what did you have before the sexually immoral? Who practice what? The dogs who practice magic arts. Magic arts. Okay. And that is also in the ESV, they use the word sorcery. The Greek word there is one of the derivations of pharmakia. That's what I put down. That's the last of the Greek words that I have on the board, pharmakia. That's where the word pharmacist comes from. Um, and that is a wide, the number of drugs that fall under sorcery or pharmakia is wide. So stuff like LSD, marijuana, you know, that kind of puts you in a higher love in a kind of mind-altering drugs, those are considered in the sorcery drugs of pharmacia. But prominent in those drugs are the drugs that induce abortion. And, um, and, and specifically when that, when the Greek was used refer, in other texts referring to abortion, pharmacia was used. So these are clearly, within pharmacia are drugs used to induce abortion. And if you look at that passage again in Revelation, the word for sorcery is very closely linked to the word for sexual immorality. Hmm. Um, and that's true of all the Revelation texts. In Galatians text, it's removed just a smidge. 
but it's basically in the same it's on the same verse. Hmm. So, so people who have who, people who have discussed this, like Dr. DeMauro spend spills a lot of ink on that, as does uh, Gorman, as does Dr. Gorman, about the link and the thought that 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 sorcery is referring, at least in part, to drugs that are inducing abortion. It's almost a stretch. Okay. Um, I mean, pharmacoy has to do with any kind of. Yeah, uh, drugs that were not beneficial. Yeah, so I could see that, but linking because so the way so you've got oikunes kai hoi pharmakoi kai hoi pornoi kai ho phones kai ho. So you have the kais which are the markers. Yeah. So you don't have it. Um, um, if you took that out, so oikunes hoi pharmakoi or hoi kunis kai hoi pharmakoi hoi pornoi, then you'd have a more direct link. Uh -huh. This appears to be catching all of those who are not holding to the one true faith, because just before you've got, um, yeah, okay, so dogs in the Greco warm or dogs were what the Pharisees would have called the Gentiles. And then the sorcerers, and then the sexually evil ones. Don't make too much of that, is what I'm saying. Because okay. they, they put it together with, so all of this is put together with idol worship, right? Yeah. Because it's connect, uh, the conjunction of guys to I, idol work, workers and all the ones brotherly loving, also doing lies. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't done a paper on this. Yeah. That's my default lately. Um, but <laughs> with this figure is like, because he'll sit down and say, well, I got a paper on that. But, but this man had done a paper on it, and it's like, um, so you're right in saying that aborted patients would have been in, in part of this, but to say that because the Kaiser, uh, okay. that's almost, I'd have, I'd have to read more on that. Okay. Uh, don't make too much of that. Okay. But it does mention the sexually immoral with the right. sorcerer. And it also mentions the idol worshipers. So the bottom line, all of this stuff boils down to idol worship. Yeah. Okay. Anything that, that you're doing to take care of self over God, over neighbor, sure. is idol worship. And all of sure. these things fit within that. Okay. Sure. It doesn't mean that you're, by the way, this doesn't mean outside the kunes. That your pet doggy's not going to get into heaven either. I mean, I can't prove that they will or not, yeah, but yeah. But this is these are these are pejoratives over people that are without faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair Same enough. thing going on in Galatians five twenty that you cite. Gal it's the same thing. It's the same word. Um, it's it's listing the bad things that people do. And, and warning against it. Right. So yeah, I just I, I did read it before I came yeah. here and was wondering where yeah. that sorcery is mentioned in there. So one of the I don't know if it's pharma bless you, if it's pharmacaea, pharmacos, pharmacon, bless you. I can't Sorry. remember which derivative is that. I've had all my shots and we bite you, you won't get rabies. The, the, the allergies have been bothering that too. The allergies have been bad. Yeah. The allergies have been horrible. Uh, nobody just ran out of the room. So I mean, okay. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. If five, it was Galatians 520. Since since we're digging through this, because you gotta mention Greek, you know, that's uh, I'm supposed to know. 520? Galatians 520. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so 19 uh, deals with the works of the flesh. Um, then it begins the list with uh, such things remain sexual evil, akatharsia, aslavia, and then it go back to idol worship again, then pharmakeia, Ekthri, Eris, Hubris, Zalos, Burning Anger. So all of these are emotional things is where it's listed within here. So it's the things that would trip. So here the pharmacaea is it probably has to do with mind altering drugs. Okay. Right? Because it's putting it with wrath and burning sure. anger and mm -hmm. sorry. Right. 
It's anything that takes your mind off of what God has called you to do, which is yeah. love God and love your neighbor. Yeah. Right? Okay. Thank you. Oh, that's helpful. Okay. So infants and children. I could do a paper. <laughs> sure. That would be great. And then we'll send it to Dr. DeMond. You've got I don't to know the time to get in with these guys. You've got to these books and then crit critique what they wrote in the book. Well, well I mean, he, he may do like I do, but he's going to use weasel words too. So yeah. Well, appears to indicate. Or yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, infants and children um, in continuity with the womb, infants and children are unique individuals valued by God, whom he calls to himself and for whom he has vocational calls. And Jesus at that phase of his life manifested as fully God and fully man to both Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles was when? When did he manifest to Gentiles as an infant? Anybody? What was the question? I was curious. As a as Bueller. <laughs> as, a, um, as, a, as an infant, when did Jesus manifest as fully God and fully man to Gentiles as an infant? As an infant. Yeah. Temple. What's that? In the temple. temple to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And what about to the Gentiles? Oh. What's the major festival that comes after Christmas? Epiphany. I was going to say. It is. Yeah. I was going to say that. What, what do we remember at Epiphany? The wedding at Cana is one of the old days, but what's the other one? And the baptism of Jesus is another reading for if we depend on what century you want to go to, but in our century, oh. the visit of the Magi, right? Oh. Oh. Yes, yes, we have to do you can tell he's taught for years. He's trying. He was trying. He was he was casting lines everywhere. Yeah. And then exposure, infanticide as and rescue. Um, infanticide is condemned in scripture, ritual, child sacrifice, or otherwise. And just as God has rescued, redeemed, and adopted us as Christians, we do the same for others whose lives are in peril. So that's um that's the witness of scripture. And the church took the ball and ran with it. And again, the examples here are not exhaustive, but they're representative. Very quickly, the Didache, uh, which was a the teaching of the 12, written anywhere between 80, 70, and 132. And um, no, not 70, 132. First century, sometime first century. in the first century. Chapter two, and I'm quoting from the Greek interlinear. You shall not do sorcery and pharmacousis is listed there. Mm -hmm. Um, you will not, you will murder, you can tell I read this from the Greek, not you will murder child and destruction, and that's a term associated with abortion, not for it. Or not here, you. in this context, the pharmakeia is tied to killing children in the womb. Yeah, yeah. Remember, context still applies, right? Sure. Neither newly begotten you will kill. So it's, it's written right off the bat. They're talking about they're they're coming out against um, ab abortion and infanticide, and there's a very similar statement in another early reading, the Epistle of Barnabas, an apocryphal work, um, and several other early um, early uh, writings um, talk about the sinfulness of abortion. Clement of Alexandria brought in the psychological damage on women. He used Luke one forty one, um, the what we talked about with John the Bap John the Lutheran. <laughs> and, and the fetal Jesus. You made that one for me, so. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was taught well. Um, I didn't teach you John Lewis, did it? Oh, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Many times you have said that. I said he was Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> John Lutheran. Anyways, the other thing that's very interesting is the pro life proclamation against abortion was actually used in defense of the Christian church. Because the church was accused of cannibalism, right? You know, with a communion, and they said, oh, "Guys, yeah. how can we possibly be eating people when we won't even abort our own babies or expose them?" Yeah, the, at one point the charge was that they baked the babies into bread and then cut the bread and ate that. They didn't understand communion. Yeah, and so that was the pagan charge. That's I can't remember if that's ingested murder or where if I read that. Mm. Yeah. 
And Tertullian came out and specifically said the fetus is a human being, even from fertilization, is his own person, although dependent on the mother. And uh, again, unlike the pagans and the majority of the Jews who considered the baby a part of the mother. Um, and then um, as time moved on, there were Christians who started adopting the pagan practices of abortion and exposure. Um, so people within the church who did it, just like the Israelites were doing in Canaan mm. um, with, the, with the gods there. And they were strongly condemned. You know, the condemnations were very, very fierce. And um, the penalties for women having an abortion were pretty severe. So, um, so the, the Synod of Elvira prescribed excommunication until the lady was on her deathbed. Nobody did it. Hell no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the Council of Ansira, which is now Ankara in Turkey, um, prescribed a minimum 10-year excommunication and penance. Now, we can argue whether those penalties, I would say, you know, with repentance and confession and absolution, mm -hmm. communion should have been restored. The point is they took this really seriously. So I'm not defending the penalties. I'm more just saying how seriously they took it. Um, the emperor of Rome, under the influence of Basil of Caesarea, possibly outlawed abortion and infanticide throughout the Roman Empire. And this witness has been consistent. The witness, the pro-life witness of the church, the anti, the opposition to abortion exposure has been consistent throughout church history. I gave you a quote there from Luther on Genesis 25, how great therefore the wickedness of human nature is. How many girls there are who prevent conception and kill and expel tender fetuses, although procreation is the work of God. Mm -hmm. So not only was the church opposed to abortion and exposure, they actually rescued these babies. Early Christians um, saw these babies dying. Survivors, if the babies managed to survive, they be frequently became prostitutes or slaves. So they rescued exposed infants. They reared them in their homes and they brought them to baptism in places where baptism was followed. <clears throat> so Tertullian did not baptize infants. He was mistaken. Um, but um, Augustine baptized infants, obviously, and actually writes down how there were holy virgins in the church. These must have been the precursors to nuns. That would basically, maybe, that would basically, I tried to find out what these holy virgins were. And those are, those are our virgins. Yeah. yeah. And they were male and they were female. And okay. they actually sat in the basilicas. So you had the bishop, then you had the attendant, the presbyters, then you had the diaconate. Yeah. Then you had the virgins, then you had the widows. Yeah. They had various orders okay. for various things. Okay. Because God has got a border and they had their particular roles and functions. Okay. But they, these virgins, um, didn't did not necessarily take oaths of celibacy. Okay, okay, okay. The Missouri Synod kind of did that in the 19th into the 20th century, where the kids all sat up front that were in catechism, oh. and then the mothers with nursing infants in the in the back, the men on one side, the women on the other side. Okay. Yeah, the cool. idea. So anyway, so these 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 I virgins. Never saw it. I went to a church with the children. I've heard of that. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these virgins brought these children to baptism and actually raised them. So the thing that's powerful, all of us, when we are in the New Jerusalem feasting at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to meet people who were exposed as infants. How powerful is that? And whose lives were saved by the church and brought to baptism and given forgiveness, life, and salvation in the, in the church. One of the passages I love, I, I included this in your list of scriptures because I just love it. I was... When I read that, I was thinking about the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. You know how Jesus brings the half-dead man to the innkeeper, the pastor, who then takes care of, you know, bringing a former vicar that discovered that. Yeah, it's yeah. in one of Luther. It's in Luther's uh, sermon actually for that week of, for Trinity thirteen. Anyways, so I thought that was really interesting. So um, the um, the um, so that occurred. Basil of Caesarea actually assisted women caught in unplanned pregnancies. So the church didn't just preach, they actually helped other uh, the babies. There, right? There's a strong history of that. And they also was the development of grephotrophia. The word means infant nourishment, but these were institutions for the care of abandoned and orphaned infants. And they eventually were absorbed by orphanages that were developed to take care of children whose parents had died. Keep in mind, back in the day, you had plagues. Right. You, you had things like worse than COVID, frankly, right. that were killing people right and left. And you had children very commonly who were left as orphans. So that is what I have on 
the pagan world and how the, and the church's witness, the church's witness has been consistent and very strong and powerful <coughs> throughout history. So I have the questions. Just before we get to the questions, I just, I'm not going to go through the embryology, the appendix. I've given you the appendix just to show you how quickly a lot forms in the baby. So this concept of formed and unformed is really a little bit hokey. Um, and the dating, keep in mind that when you say, when there's a mom that says I'm at 16 weeks or I'm at 20 weeks, that's not the age of the baby. The baby is three weeks younger. The dating occurs from the time of the last period. And then the fertilization happens about three weeks later. So, so there was a little bit, I tried to clarify, most of my things are the age of the baby in this list, not, not so much the dates of the mother. One mistake at 16 weeks, I meant to say skin cream and not sin cream. Oh, <laughs> I've read it skin cream. Yeah, it's skin cream. Um, I, I, I realized Psalm 51 and sin, my mother conceived me, but the cream is, um, is, is to protect the skin. Um, so, anyways, um, so I'm sorry, my 62 year old fingers don't type very well. So that's just a, that's just a reference for you guys. And I don't really want to spend time going over that now, but I just, I thought one of you is going to ask, well, when does so-and-so develop? When does this develop? So I thought, let me just give it to you up front and that way you have it. Any questions so far before we get into the questions that I thought about that I put together for the you guys to think about? Mine's just a random detail. Yeah. So the Hippocratic Oath, does it still contain this language? What does the Hippocratic Oath? So the Hippocratic Oath, yes, it does. But the Hippocratic Oath that is used in medical schools, many of them delete that language or have changed it. Okay, to read something else. My class, it was really stupid. We voted. This was a few years after Roe v. Wade and the women were gung ho about doing abortions. And they did not want to take the Hippocratic Oath. So they found this Oath of Maimonides. Maimonides was a, an 11th or 12th mm -hmm. century Jewish physician. He also wrote a lot of commentary on scripture and all kinds of other things. And he was a theologian as well. And, um, and he wrote this oath about being a physician. And he doesn't have language about abortion. The funny thing is, I would very much doubt that Maimonides himself would have condoned elective abortions. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's just no way. I just don't see it. I mean, I looked him up and a lot of the article about him, it was stuff that I didn't know about, not the medical part, but the Jewish theological part. Mm -hmm. But but so yeah, they say it, but they say it, but they don't. Um, but but they change the language. Even more significantly now, they have before they take the Hippocratic oath. There's now this white coat ceremony um, that they do when they enter medical school that did not exist when I went to medical school. They receive their white coats as an introduction to the profession, and the class kind of takes an oath where they where they recite their core ethics. So our core ethic was first do no harm. They have that in their way down and their core ethic now is we will respect each person's autonomy. And that's Genesis three language. Yeah, we know you're a God to yourself. Sure. <laughs> self law which means you can do assisted suicide. You know, exactly. Right, right. It's Sex not change. And it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. And that is put together by yeah. a group called Humanism in Medicine. I think it should be disbanded, but we'll talk about that when we talk about euthanasia, because what I read about humanism in the last week, it's chilling. <clears throat> but that's that's a long right, answer no, to your you. question. Yeah. I was under the impression they don't even say that oath, the Hippocratic Oath anymore. It's been forever okay. since I've been to a med school graduation. The last time I went, they said something, the Hippocratic Void Oath, but it really, they had changed a lot of the language. So, yeah. Okay, so it's so a question on the uh, ancient practices and paganism, yeah. sacrifice to Molech. Um, do they treat that in any depth in terms of for you say it's for prosperity, but wasn't it more was it more for uh, to show the god by giving up the child that you wanted a fertile land or 
Did they get into that? Those books did not get into okay. that. I read it in a separate paper. Okay. Because I was looking up, though they did not address Molech, but I wanted to bring it in because I, sure. a lot because of it shows it, up in scripture. Because it shows up and it shows up in scripture. So I did I can email you the article. I, it's just in it. Well, I've read something similar, but I didn't know if they got into it in there. So it's, it's almost like, okay, I want I want successful harvest, so I'm gonna kill my child, yeah. which could help harvest the harvest. Yeah. I mean something missing here i mean it, it's a little different than the temple prostitution yeah. where you showed the god what you wanted by having yeah. sex with a prostitute but i, I don't yeah. get it I, I don't get it either and then one of the other things that came up is in another discussion somewhere else we talked I, I complained about having my tax dollars going to pay for abortion and somebody asked well didn't they do that in the old uh in, in the roman empire and somebody else has just done an article on it no it was never paid for by the state interesting Hmm. The state didn't take care of health care. They didn't take care of any of that. No, yeah, that was no, you had to do it on your own. So it wasn't just abortion. They just didn't pay for anything. <laughs> and a lot of people. Can we go back? A lot of people do really pay for the pleasure barges for the emperor. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> a lot of women wrapped their own wombs and tried to expel the babies that way because, I mean, it was cheap, you know? Huh. So. So question, guys, what parallels do you all see between current practices and trends in abortion and infanticide? in the past, and how would you theologically characterize abortion and infanticide? What are kind of parallels do you see between what's going on today and what I've described? Well, it's an attack on the image of God, though, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so theologically. OK. Uh, so I mean, that would be the common theme, though, right? It's a rejection of life rejection of what god has given uh-huh throughout history I and mean, that's just absolutely and the, and the reasons are the same yeah the reasons are exactly you don't have the, the you don't have the god Moloch, but you yeah. have the god of self or whatever it yeah is. utilitarianism comes in and so forth exactly and i would argue that a lot of what you're seeing going on in the world today is basically neo-paganism mm -hmm. You know, it's basically it's um you know it's not church stuff. It's it's basically pagan practice. But it goes back to the self as God. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's where we're at now, and it goes back to the autonomy that you were talking about in the, in the medical schools and respecting the patient's autonomy. And the same arguments, and you're going to probably get to it when we get to euthanasia. The same yeah. argument can use be used for suicide, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right? absolutely. So what I want, right? Why not? Absolutely. So the scripture that I referred to in the second question, the Leviticus and Peter, talks about holiness. You know, be holy as I am holy. So how does God's call to holiness inform our approach to life issues in our personal practice and our external proclamation? Well, what is it to be holy? That thicker sermon last night kind of related to this discussion when he was talking a lot about the flesh. And at one point he said, when you're at the, the altar and you receive um, the Lord, that the Lord abides in you. So being holy is being one with God, being mm -hmm. in the presence of God. Well, how do we do that? By God's grace, right? Mm -hmm. So we confess our sins and receive forgiveness. So, so in terms of holiness, in terms of life issues, we look at ourselves and our own attitudes or our own actions. If we find that they're against God's word, we confess our sins, we receive forgiveness, that Christ died to bring us forgiveness, so we're declared holy. So that's, you know, it's not an excuse to do what I want so I can just ask for forgiveness, but when I do fall, I have the opportunity to be forgiven and to be restored. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, like uh, Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, who's there to condemn you? no one will then go and say no more i mean what you don't have is the i'm sure she walked away going how do i do that <laughs> <laughs> right but yeah the other aspect of the holiness i was thinking about is the set apart right and and that's when you talk through the old testament um people and how they adapted the pagan practices this whole concept of being set apart 
they were put on the Levant. They were put on the major trade route where everybody had to go through there. They had weird hair. They had they treated their their families well. They they didn't do everything the pagans do, and everybody had to notice that going through. Yeah. So that was God's way of doing mission work in the Old Testament. He stuck his people there with these holiness codes. And well, of course, when they failed, then they looked just like everybody else, right? Yeah. And so when it comes to us in the church, you know, we, we can never be people outside the church tend to think we're holier than thou. But we recognize what we are, which is sinners and receive forgiveness. But we're still put where we're put so that people can see that there is an alternative to yeah. me, me, me. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So what are the historic precedents to so-called pro-choice Christianity, which you see in groups like the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice? And actually, you see abortion as official doctrine in mainline denominations, and DeMauro goes through a lot of that in his book. And how would you characterize this sad development? So what are the historic precedents to pro-choice Christianity? To pro-choice Christianity. New Orthodox, the guys who gave up the, the, the inerrancy of the scripture. Okay. Or are you thinking about it in terms of the kind of, syncretism? Of yes, history? that's what I was oh, okay. thinking about. Uh, I thought we were like 20th century. Yeah, okay. I, was, I was going back to the syncretism of the Jews in the, in the, in the, in the promised land. You know where they were sacrificed. The kind of the worship, worship practices of yeah. the people around, them. and oh, they right, were right. sacrificing so, their babies and then going into the temple and participating in the worship, and that's basically what you're seeing with pro-choice Christianity today. Um, and how would you respond to calls for abortion in cases of a diagnosed disability in the baby? Oh my God, this baby just had a amniocentesis and has this god awful diagnosis, may not even live, you know, for many weeks after birth or may end up with trisomy 21, Down syndrome. You go to places like Iceland, the Netherlands, the whole population, and you don't have a baby born with Down syndrome anymore because they're all being killed in the womb. Mm. In the United States, the numbers born have been reduced. The birth incidence of cystic fibrosis now is a lot lower than it was when I was a pulmonary fellow because they're getting aborted. They're making the diagnosis and they're getting aborted. How would you respond to calls for abortion? But the baby's gonna suffer, the baby. How would you respond to that? We all suffer. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> True, right? And God can bring good out of suffering. Right. And, and the, having worked with the, I had a Mennonite friend, and they had the Sunshine Children's Home, because Mennonites, there's a lot of inbreeding among the Amish and the Mennonite mm -hmm. people. So they had a lot of cases of hydrocephalia and, and so forth. They had these kids in a home, and it was like we're going to sell these kids. They were, they were being loved, and they were being taken care of, and and so it gave people an opportunity to share God's love. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would come at, and it sounds kind of emotional, but I, I would come at it from this standpoint. I mean, God bless you if you ever have to put your arms around a woman who realizes what has happened to her mm -hmm. when when the child has died. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be at, yes, you give God's comfort, but they can't get it back. And, and the ache and the pain that goes with that. My first experience was that actually in college with a young woman uh, who just, when she realized she, she just broke apart. I had no skills. I just, you know, I told her, yeah. you, know, you know, we talked her through it and talked about God's forgiveness. But man, why, why even let a woman go through that if you can, you know? Is that good? I mean, it, it's tough enough. Do you, I mean, I, we do funerals from miscarriages, okay? I mean, that, that's tough too. But, but if you if you can avoid that kind of pain, and even if the child is uh, special needs, well, it's okay. If you really want to know, ask Sally and Victor. Mm -hmm. You'll see Sammy put the candles out. You know, they knew. Yeah. Sammy, <laughs> my class, this does not leave it well. That one child, one child in my class, I don't identify. Um, I was in the Sunday school class and he was in there and I had my students and we came across the concept of incense. And I said, what does incense mean? What does it signify? And none of the kids knew. And he jumped up and started singing, let my prayer rise before you as incense. I'm like, bingo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, 
Yeah. What about like I, I have a niece who um, when she was pregnant they somehow figured out that the baby was going to have spina bifida. Mm -hmm. And so they did this really experimental surgery where they In literally the took yeah. it out. Yes. Yeah. You know? yes. And so that was life threatening to do that surgery. Right. Do you do that or do you just let the baby be born how it's born? Or? That's a tough well, one. A tough was that the first time that was ever tried? I think it's. Been I don't know. I don't before. think it was the first time, but it was yeah. still experimental. Like they paid for all of it right, because it was right. still experimental. Uh, if there's a better chance of the child surviving with it, you know, this gets in. That sounds almost like utilitarianism, but I mean, if there's a better chance of the child surviving by having the surgery than having the surgery, these are tough calls you make one on one. You know, I think. Well, I, mean, I, I know people that have had babies had surgery yeah. in the womb. Yeah. To repair like hearts and stuff like that. This one they like, I mean, it's, they left it attached. Right, they yeah, still attached. Back. Back well, it's for the yeah. good of the child, right? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, they weren't trying to kill the child. Intent. The, the intent. Right. The intent, yeah. the intent and the actions were designed to better the child's life. I mean, my, one of my friends in high school, um, Rick, uh, his sister, I have spine of the, the um, it was different back then. You just had it and you were. Mm -hmm paralyzed or whatever and the waist down or whatever so uh, i would say in that case you know the intent wasn't to take the child out to kill it mm -hmm. but to create uh, uh, healing and mm -hmm. we can do things now that they couldn't do before and right? it was successful right. yes. oh that's awesome. great right. that's, that's wonderful. wonderful so let me throw another one at you in canada a few years ago they discovered that men could bear babies and they did it by an experiment where they transplanted a womb with a child in it in a man's body, letting carry it to term and then deliver the baby. Well, in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> through C-section. <laughs> so, so this is one of those, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Yeah. Right, right. I and mean, what is the benefit to society for that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you had to cut some woman, oh, wouldn't take this out, to put it in some man to say you could do it. Yeah. The problem also with transplant is you've got to give the guy immunosuppressives in order to not reject the. I mean, what does that do to the baby? Tissue. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, things are. Promiscuous. The other aspect with the uh, diagnosed disability, and we'll talk about it with euthanasia too, probably more, is that people have to come out of their incurvatus and say they're incurved. And curved, actually curved, in curved into themselves and actually come out and take care of this person. And 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 that's actually provides growth for the people who are giving the care. So um, okay. So now you see a lot of there's um you hear reports that babies who are attempted abortion and they come out alive and they're saying, well, let's not take care of them. What's the historic precedent for intentionally not caring for babies born alive? So God will murder them. What's that? It's called murder. Well, <laughs> but what, what was the practice in the Greco-Roman world? That exposure. The exposure. The exposure. Mm -hmm. So I'm just asked that to let you realize that exposure has come back. But put this to a human context. Years ago, a nurse who stopped attending when she had to stand by a baby yeah. in the delivery room till it died. That was it. And she was traumatized. That's PTSD for the rest of your life. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I had it, at, I was a med student and I was in an abortion case. I was in Massachusetts, so it's a woman's right. I'm, I'm a young kid, I was in the zeitgeist, caught up in it, and it, it scarred me. And I just have to tell you guys, I just wanna tell everybody, if anybody's been through this, or knows anybody that's been through this and regrets it, individual confession and absolution, I cannot speak enough about how wonderful that is. I, I'll just throw that out. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But. I have to throw it out. It's true. No, absolutely. It's real. Writing confessional absolutions for those things that are really troubling you and to hear God's word pronounced upon you and His forgiveness helps. It's very painful. Yeah. That's one thing you don't get in general Protestantism. What do you do? There's no individual confession. There's no private confession. Yeah, private. We have it, and it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question before I ask it, the one, I'm not gonna make you open it because it's getting late, but the passage in Ezekiel, write it down, read it at some point. It's so powerful. It's, it's 
it's it's it has to do with it's it's a it's a vision of God's people who are pouring themselves with the other gods. So God leaves them almost like an exposed infant. You know, the cord is not cut and they're out there and they're basically dying of exposure. And then God comes in and has mercy and washes them and then dresses them up like a bride. So this is basically, this the vision there in Ezekiel. It, it's kind of a vision like an exposed infant is the comparison, but it's the bringing in of those who are spiritually exposed, i.e. each and every one of us at some point in our lives into the church, being okay, washed in baptism. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> is that the text on Sunday? Oh, that's the same text, oh. but it's the later text that it deals with the same thing. Now, okay. go ahead. And it doesn't hurt you to hear it more than once. And bringing the person <laughs> into the church, you know, and washing and becoming part of the bride, of, becoming part of the bride of Jesus. And it's a beautiful, beautiful passage. So that, and, and I bring that up because the people who were involved in the early rescues. That's one of the passages that they use to describe the rescue of the church, the other being Moses, right. um, you know, That's out there on the on the Nile River being brought into the house of Pharaoh. But the, you guys all know that story. I brought up the Ezekiel one because that's one that's not, not widely known, which, but that it's beautiful. And so um, what historic precedents do you see for today's life affirming outreaches like Family First and other Christian adoption agencies? Birch. The Holy Virgin. Yeah. 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 They had a whole bunch of early church examples of yeah. caring for babies. And that's that's the thing that many pro-life groups miss. It's not just pro-life, but it's pro-continuation of life. You got to support the mother. You got to mm -hmm. and the father, which family first actually does. You got to support more than just keeping the baby from dying. Yeah. Did somebody say something? Did somebody say? I think my uh, phone went off. Oh, your phone went off. Okay. 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 No. And then finally, what is the telos of Christian, meaning the end, the ultimate purpose? What are we want? What is what are we wanting to achieve with Christian pro-life advocacy? This is an apologetics class of the Christian faith. So I'm going to give you a clue as to what I want. I want, I want, I want to make this more than a more than a fancy life team meeting. <laughs> Think about it. What do you? What's the tellers? Why well, save a human life? To what end? Bring in the faith. <laughs> Bring in the go. gospel. Yeah. There you Bring go. in the gospel. That's that's, that's right. Yeah. So our our. God does it, but our goal is to populate heaven, not hell. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, hell's plenty full. Okay. So, and, and that goes back to what is the nature, what is the nature of God? He, he has an alien nature, which is to punish and show his wrath and all that other stuff. And again, pro-life people tend to be with the negative images. I don't know if you've seen the marches where they hold up to dead babies, and, yeah. you know. The dead baby on the stick. Yeah, that's just not. Yeah. Uh, it is so. That that's the alien nature. But God restrain. He only uses that long enough to bring people repent, so that He can forgive them. So we're called, whether it's with um, preborn or at the end of life, to to show God's mercy and His grace for people. And so it's. Uh, while things that we may make you angry when you hear about terminating a child in the womb because it had some defect or whatever, check the anger. The, the goal is to get the person that survived that mm -hmm. to hear the gospel. And so the anger is not, let the politicians do that. Yeah. I mean, the anger is there not, is a righteous anger, but. Yeah, but it's every not, time you try to have it, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. You ever try to be righteously angry? Yeah. Angry at something? Yeah, how long does that last? Right. Until you no, just well, go into full wrath, right? We want to bring up the, it's a forgivable sin. Bingo. Yeah. And, and so many people that have dealt with this don't, don't hear that. They hear it's wrong. Okay, that's fine. It, that, right. But you can't just end with it's wrong. You got to end with, and God can make it right. 
Now, if you take the reform view, this is a discussion we had around a lunch table at Trinity, a bunch of doctoral students, right? And the one guy, we were talking about life and, and heaven and being full. And he's, the guy, Southern Baptist guy from South Africa, he's American, but he's in South Africa. So I think heaven's got a lot more people in it than we know. Okay, no, it's not. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> what is <laughs> this mean? You know, all the aborted babies that were predestined to be saved. Oh, so you're, you're putting your hope in predestination and salvation. You see, yeah, they can never sin then. So you're actually advocating salvation by, by death. death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? If, you, if, if that is your argument, kill them, all. kill them all, because then the ones that are predestined to go to heaven are going to heaven anyhow. The ones that are predestined to go to hell, they're going to hell anyhow. So just kill them all. That's reformed evangelism. <laughs> you sound like a <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, and I mean, there are other pro-life groups. I mean, you have secular pro-life groups. Yes. You've got, not every secular person is, is pro-death. You've got, you've got Jewish pro-life groups. You've got gay pro-life groups. But again, what distinguishes us is that we pray that God will use us and people will come to the font and then to the altar. We actually have associated with this church a woman who was one of the two co-founders of Feminists for Life. Huh. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't think I've met her actually, but I have gotten emails. Emails, from her. yes. That's yeah. Nice. She's, she's Christian. She's Lutheran, but she yeah. started Feminist for Life. Yeah. But she so, no longer holds that, correct? Right? Or no? She holds to Christian feminism, which is basically biblical feminism, which okay. is everybody's created in the image of God, so let's treat each other nice. The, the original <laughs> feminists were people who were pro, pro life. Hmm. The original feminist. Like not, yeah, she's nowhere near what the movement is now. Yeah. So, anyways, well, good. I um so that's basically you know what we have um from the abortion. And now you had sent out an article too. Yeah. I did. I did. That was just more of a general overview, uh discussing basically both uh well, it talks about basically the sanctity of life itself and how we're not really autonomous if we belong to christ we're not autonomous therefore our body we can't just do whatever we want with our bodies right um and it, it, yeah he applies that to uh, uh abortion uh sexual ethics and then euthanasia um uh so it was just more of a general and some of what he talked about will come up for sure under euthanasia yeah, yeah, he makes the interesting. I mean, just to talk about what we're going to talk about a little bit next time. Yeah, it, he talks about the passage in Acts, uh, where the deacons were to give. Yeah, the apparently food was being withheld from the right. widows, right? And then they formed the deacons the said, seven go, go feed, them. To feed them because the apostles would spend time with prayer and the prayers and the ministry and the studying of the word. <coughs> It was um, thought provoking when he brought up people asserting they can do as they please so long as they don't harm anyone else. Very good argument. Yeah. Yeah. Very good argument. Yeah. 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 Well, what if you know? What about God? Are you including God in, in anyone else? I thought that was pretty clever. Right. 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 And he makes a thing. Talks about. What is it? What I know. He talks about, um, well, I don't know. When I, when it's an interesting, I, is it a harmful, is there, it's, a, it's a, a harmless, a harmless sin or harmless act, like yeah. suicide. So what, is the, like, what is the satanic lie behind all of this? Your autonomy. Bingo. My body is mine, but it's yep. not. It's not. It's created by God. It's given to you as, for stewardship. A woman's body is given to her for her husband's benefit, his body is given to her for her benefit. So you can't even, you know, if your body belongs to her, you can't do anything you want to with it. She had it's hers, and if her body belongs, to you, you can't. You know what I mean? It's it's a. It's, uh, and then when we take it even farther, we're all members of the body of Christ. Well, if we're attached to Christ, our head, how dare I, as the little finger, go do what I want to do? 
because that cuts me off from the body, right? So we stay attached. And and he's got some excellent argue, arguments yeah. that, that, that would help, I think, people to think, having worked with people over the years who, yeah. for whatever reason, have cut themselves off and then wonder why things are not going the way they should. Yeah. Well, let's reconnect you back here. And that's part of my premarital counseling with mm -hmm. uh, uh, husbands and wives. You know, you, you don't have a right to give away somebody else's property. Right. <laughs> Or they talk about the victimless crime, right? Yeah, there's no such well, thing. Well, <laughs> we're social beings. Do you have a parents? They're probably worried sick about whatever you're doing, you, addictions or whatever. I mean, it's not just yourself, it's society. When you kill yourself, you're depriving yeah. the community. Right, right, of right. Your presence. And you're causing pain for those who right. will always go, what could I have done to change that? Yeah, yeah. Um, what did I do wrong? Why what did I do you know? wrong, right? Because again, they're looking at themselves, but still, it, it's still a question, you know? Yeah. So why do that? Why, you know, it goes back to- We are not a, I don't we're know. not, despite what the song says, I am not a rock, I am not an island, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Everybody here's old enough to know that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always took that lyric to me, he's trying to, convince himself of that but deep down right he, he does not he knows he it's not, yeah, he knows it's not, not my books and I, yeah. you know yeah. but really he's just dying he's yeah. aching he's lonely yeah, yeah. anything else you know what we're yeah. talking about ryan i know it's harmony simon and garfunkel Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I knew that song. Winter's Day. Yeah. On a deep and dark. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Can I uh, those two prayers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's finish let's, with those. Absolutely. I have two prayers from the pastoral care companion. This is what when pastor goes into your house or the hospital when you're sick or when a deacon comes. This is the book that they bring with them. The book. And I found um, a prayer, two prayers I'd like us all to, or I'll, I'll read them and then we can pray them. One is when a mother is considering an abortion and the other is for the comfort of one who has undergone an abortion. And I think these will be a nice coda to our session um, this evening. So let us pray. <clears throat> God of all grace, out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, you have given us life and commanded us not to hurt or harm our neighbor in his body. Teach us to care for all unborn children whom you have created in your image. Grant your grace to all mothers that by your word and spirit, they may live according to your will and have the courage to nurture and cherish their children. Surround them with those who will rejoice in their children and provide for, the, for their needs of body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, look with mercy on your daughters who suffer the shame of abortion. For the sake of Christ Jesus, our Savior, forgive them all their sins and remove all feelings of guilt and despair. Protect them from the accusing voices of others and the accusations from within. By your spirit, increase their faith that they may entrust themselves and their children into your fatherly hands. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. You guys have an awesome weekend. Next time you can only invite you to